Good morning, everyone. Happy to be with you all. Uh, my name is Isaac, and uh, this is Napoleon, who joins me for all my <laughs> various calls. Uh, I'm a, a postdoctoral scientist uh, located in uh, and around Chicago in the United States. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, free genes, frenzymes, and uh, why we should democratize the means of biotechnological production and globally distribute it. So let me just share my slides, share my screen rather. Pop over here. All right, there it is. Let's democratize and globally distribute the means of biotechnological production. So why, why do we do that? Well, there's a story we tell about biotechnology, which is one of rapid growth and world-changing potential. So these are charts that uh, the analyst Rob Carlson has compiled looking at at least in the United States, the proportion of the economy that is due to advanced biotechnology, genetic engineering. And what he basically shows is that there's sort of an exponential growth uh, curve over the last few decades, uh, sort of indicating this, this technology is just taking off. It's gonna uh, impact more and more, uh, gonna transform uh, how we make things and, and how we do things and just give it time and we'll, we'll build a better world with biotechnology. But the thing I want to drive home for you today is that we are on a rapidly approaching deadline. The um, UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, has released a number of reports in the last few years basically saying that we as humans, all of human civilization, have to cut our carbon emissions, our global carbon emissions, by at least 50% uh, from 2017 levels by 2030 if we want to have a better than even chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and averting the really catastrophic uh, climate feedback loops. Um, and I would really recommend uh, you read uh, a book called The Ministry for the Future if you want to read more about uh, you know, what's necessary to get to a good and livable future. Um, uh, but the thing to understand is that we are moving in the wrong direction right now. Uh, we're, we need to cut our global carbon emissions in half in a decade, and we are increasing our global carbon emissions as we speak. Um, and the some, sort of thing like four of the biggest uh, corporations around the world are oil and gas companies. This is not, not a good situation. Um, so we need a massive economic, technological, and political mobilization starting now if we're going to combat the climate crisis and build a good future. Um, and biological technologies can help with that. Uh, technology alone is insufficient uh, as, uh, as our experience with the pandemic has shown. You know, if even, even if we have the right technology, for instance, for vaccine production, uh, if our policies restrict the uh, development and deployment of that technology, as, as the US and Europe have done with vaccine manufacturing patents um, and, and intellectual property and technical specifications, uh, then we can still have really horrific uh, worldwide outcomes despite having the technological solutions at hand. Um, but uh, technology, although it is insufficient, it is necessary, and biological technology can help in a lot of ways to decarbonize human civilization and build a, a, a sustainable material base uh, for humanity. Um, in particular, it can replace animal agriculture, which is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, it can replace the petrochemical industry by, you know, producing uh, fine chemicals and uh, brewing those in microbes, um, or we were to play, or making replacements for um, and improvements on uh, things that are currently derived from uh, fossil uh, fuels and fossil chemicals. Um, we can create microbial alternatives to industrial processes. So like the nitrogen that goes into fertilizing our crops, uh, there are ways to engineer microbes to produce that nitrogen and associate with those crops. Um, and there's also ways to engineer microbes or harness naturally occurring microbes to produce cement, for instance, cement, which is 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, uh, you know, although we, we definitely need to get rid of most internal combustion engines, most cars and things like that, um, and replace them with you know, electric uh, transportation, uh, electric public transportation, solar energy, wind energy, all that good stuff. But for the few things that where we can't replace those internal combustion engines, for instance, jets, uh, you know, aircraft, uh, rocket ships, uh, all these types of things that, that just can't run on batteries, uh, bio-based fuels uh, are a good option there for some sort of carbon neutral means of uh, rapid transportation. Um, so basically we need to accelerate the democratization and distribution of all of these biological technologies and more, and we do need to do it now. Uh, we need to build a just, resilient, and carbon negative civilization in the next 10 to 30 years. That is the task of our lifetime, of our 
of our careers. Uh, the, the, the span of our, our working lives is going to be when we're, it's decided whether we go to get to the good future or whether we get to a very, very bad future. Um, so biological technologies everywhere and at every scale will be required. And right now we don't have anywhere near enough biotechnological practitioners or biotechnological productive capacity to achieve this transformation. So why is that? Why don't we have enough? Well, bioengineering and synthetic biology have been very difficult and expensive um, uh, continuing through now. Uh, there's, a, there's a major cost barrier. So for instance, the, the cost of DNA sequencing um, you know, at, at the turn of the 20, 21st century, it costs $3 billion to sequence a human genome. Now, the cost of sequencing a human genome has dropped by like 10,000 fold uh, since then. So it now costs on the order of a few thousand dollars, maybe uh, maybe $1,000 to sequence a human genome. However, that's only at bulk, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at high throughput. Um, the actual instruments uh, to perform the sequencing are still very expensive, at least for the market dominant company. So this is Illumina. Uh, it's the company that, that controls most of the, uh, the next generation sequencing market. And its cheapest instrument is the iSeq, which costs 25,000 US dollars, uh, which is quite expensive. And it's most expensive high-end instrument, the one that you can actually get like a close to a thousand dollar human genome on, costs a million dollars each, uh, which is not, that's not democratized, that's not distributed. There's no, there's, there's no way we're going to be getting to enough uh, biotechnological capacity with million dollar instruments. Um, similarly for DNA synthesis, um, although the cost of synthesis has dropped significantly over the past 20 years. So, you know, around 2000, it cost $4 per nucleotide per DNA base to uh, make a synthetic gene. So for an average thousand base pair gene costs $4,000 for, it costs $4,000 for that. Now the price has dropped about 40 fold. Uh, so so the, the prices you can get from twist for a one kilobase, uh, 1000 base pair gene is about $70. Um, and uh, you know, other, other companies run in the range of around 100, $150. Uh, this, is pretty, this is a good improvement, but if you think about, you know, we like to use this metaphor for bioengineering of treating biology like software in some ways. DNA is the code of life, right? And, and if you, you want to program biology to do useful stuff, you got to program its code. And that means you got to write DNA. Um, and I, imagine if every time a software programmer had to, uh, wanted to write a new line of code, it cost him $70 to do, or it cost her $70 to do. That would not be, we wouldn't really have a software in industry the way that we do around the world because it would be so expensive and difficult to use. Um, and so this cost barrier is significant, particularly for people who want to do bioengineering but are in resource constrained environments who don't have, who aren't nearby pre existing biotechnological industry, uh, you know, pre-existing pre gene synthesis companies and things like that. Uh, people in the in developing world, the global south, uh, the uh, places that have experienced colonization and, and neo-colonization, um, this is not accessible for them. Um, and similarly, intellectual property barriers, these creative monopolies that we place on the fruits of technology um, in order to ostensibly uh, promote a sort of uh, private investment and, and build out uh, in the market um, of, of technological capacity. Um, this has been a real barrier, especially for uh, sort of synthetic biology. You know, the, the, the old model um, in biotechnology was patenting every single individual gene that, and then piece of DNA that you used. Whereas synthetic biology is all about sort of trying to build libraries of different standardized genetic parts and then composing sophisticated biological devices by combining many of those parts together. And if every single one of those parts is patented by somebody else, it becomes prohibitively difficult to actually secure the rights to all of those pieces to actually build a useful genetic device, a useful biological device, and then be able to scale it and uh, 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 sell its product on the market or sell it or sell it to people who want to use it. Um, and so this has been a, a real hindrance for uh, research. Um, there have been uh, attempts to address it 
uh, for instance, uh, through AdGene, this plasmid sharing uh, uh, platform and, and repository. Uh, but there are restrictions around this. You know, the AdGene distributes its plasmin under the Uniform Biological Material Transfer Agreement, which is a, a, a great material transfer agreement for its time, which was about 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but uh, it restricts the recipient of those plasmids, of those, of those useful DNA devices um, from doing anything commercial with, with the material, from even redistributing the material. And it base, AdGene basically only functions for academic labs. Um, and so if you're trying to, for instance, scale biotechnological productive capacity all around the world in order to accelerate the transition to a sustainable human civilization within the next 10 to 30 years, this isn't going to cut it. Um, and sort of similarly, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which I, I'll be talking about a bit more later, um, they maintain a registry of standard biological parts. Um, and this registry is kind of a, a library of Alexandria of biotechnology. It's been developed over the past like 15 years by uh, you know, undergraduates, high schoolers, grad students, um, you know, postgraduate uh, researchers, all who uh, sort of competed in teams for the genetic engineer, these genetic engineering prizes. And, um, contributed useful genetic parts and devices to this library. But the library exists in a sort of legal limbo because there's stuff in it that's patented, there's stuff in it that's not, that's not patented. They don't distribute it under a material transfer agreement, but they do request that um, user, that recipients, uh, they, they require that recipients not share any of the stuff from the registry, all of these genetic parts with anyone else, just keep it within the competition, and that they share only share back uh, devices, biological devices that they build with these genetic parts back to iGEM. And so it sort of has been a walled garden up until very recently. I'll talk more about how that might be changing later. Um, and of course, there's also this expertise barrier. So that we've got the cost barrier, we've got the intellectual property barrier, and we've got the expertise barrier. It takes a lot of time and money to become a proficient bioengineer. You have to learn how to pipette, how, how do you move small volumes of liquids back and forth over and over and over again for hours very consistently without getting extremely bored. I listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts. That's how I handle it. Um, and I'm also learning to do lab automation so they don't have to do it anymore. Um, but it takes a lot of time to learn to do that well. It takes a lot of time to learn how not to breathe on your samples and contaminate them, or, you know, how, how to use flames and, and sterile technique, how to manage your time so that, you know, your bacterial growth <laughs> waits, waits for no one. Uh, and if, if it grows fast where you're supposed to induce it, then you're sort of out of luck. Um, and there's also the whole, uh, you know, how do you manage and track samples in a way that uh, makes ensures that you don't like forget what you're doing halfway through a big long experiment or you know create something and then put it in a freezer and forget it forever. Um, all of these things take a lot of time and effort to learn how to do well and to learn to use tools to, to, to manage these things well. Um, and so that's a major barrier to becoming a bioengineer. Um, so how do we make this easier? Well, let's draw some inspiration from the computing revolution, which you know has genuinely transformed the world in the span of just a few decades. Um, so this is sort of this uh, on the order of the scale of the transformation that we'd hopefully want to achieve. A little bit smaller, you know, we're trying to do you know, all of all of human energy and material civilization in the next couple of decades, but this is a good starting point. So how did, how did the computers do it? Well, about in the in the mid 1970s. Um, Apple released its first ever uh, home uh, personal computing device. It was one of a, a number of companies that started making these, but uh, we'll just use Apple for an example. And this initial computer, the Apple One, uh, it cost $3,000 in 2019 dollars, uh, in 2019 US dollars, and its costs to operate were electricity. And so that sort of is in the range of what is uh, accessible, at least for, you know, upper middle class tech hobbyists in the United States um, back, in, back in the 1970s. Um, and then if we move to the Apple II, which was released just a couple of years later um, by Apple, this is a little bit more expensive. You know, it's, it's 5,500 to 11,000 US dollars. That's 2019 US dollars. But again, the cost to operate is electricity. So it, it's basically free to learn how to do software and, and do useful stuff with, with the software on the computer. And importantly, they've added this functionality, you know, this graphical user interface. So they've reduced the skill barrier um, uh, with this graphical user interface. Uh, and this really made computers much, much more widely available. It was the beginning of 
the personal computing revolution that became the smartphone revolution, which is the reason that, you know, so the billions of people around the world are walking around with, you know, what would have been a supercomputer in, you know, the 1970s and 1960s in their pocket today. Uh, now, as this computing revolution was happening, there was also a lot of interesting stuff happening in software, uh, in particular, sort of, sort of some of the founders of um, software engineering as a discipline were looking at what was happening in industry, uh, and they were not happy about it. Uh, they were not happy about uh, the sort of collaborative uh, culture that they had built in, in academia um, being replaced by uh, sort of commercial interests that were trying to secure monopolies on the rights to use software. They, they were not a fan of Bill Gates and Microsoft uh, in particular. And so a few of them, uh, particularly Richard Stallman um, and, and a number of other people started working on developing um, completely free and open source uh, software uh, that could be, uh, could rival, uh, would attempt to rival the stuff that was proprietary, the stuff that was locked down by these this intellectual property and creative monopolies. And so uh, Richard Stallman helped build the GNU operating system, um, uh, which is a, you know, a set of useful software packages for running a computer and released it under a software license, actually a, a form of copyright license that explicitly gave the, uh, the user the permission to look at the code, to modify the code, to reshare the code, and just require that the user um, ensure that they they also uh, made sure that anyone they sent the code to would also be in, in, obliged to reshare the code freely. So this sort of idea of an eternally expanding sort of freedom to operate and, and uh, free software, open source software. And open source software licenses have come to uh, dominate a lot of things. They, they, uh, um, it, in the computing world, um, and they've been really good. And then in 1991, uh, Linus Tor Torvald and a number of people built the Linux kernel, which was this sort of this core essential uh, piece of software for running computers that combined with GNU created an entire operating system made entirely of free and open source software. And you might think, okay, these are people who are essentially hobbyists and academics trying to build something uh, uh, and compete with multi-billion dollar companies, you know, Microsoft, Apple, um, what, what could they possibly build that, that anyone would want to use uh, compared to what these massive companies, all these resources could build? Because, you know, Linux as, an, uh, as, as a, a software operating system, it's, it's completely free to use, it only costs electricity. How are they gonna, how are they gonna make this mean anything? Well, you know, about 20 or 30 years later, where we are right now, Linux is basically the foundational operating system of the internet. You know, if you think about, I would imagine that the, uh, the Zoom servers that are currently processing the recording of the video that I'm making right now are running probably on Amazon Web Servers or some other cloud software platform. And the server farms, uh, the, the actual computers that uh, this processing is being done on almost certainly run Linux as an operating system because it's just so useful, so so sort of interoperable and, and easy to use for specifically uh, as a, a sort of platform for computing. Um, and so that's a really sort of inspiring, uh, uh, inspiring uh, anecdote for me. That's an inspiration for me that, you know, sort of hobbyists, people who just had a really strong or like or moral urge to make this sort of technology free and open have created something that formed a fundamental infrastructure, technological infrastructure around the world. So we think about these examples and we should ask ourselves, you know, where are the analogs in biotechnology? Where is biotechnology's GNU public license? It's open source wetware license. Where is biotech's GNU Linux? Where, where is the open source wetware library that enables anyone around the world to build and do useful things with, with uh, you know, combine uh, pieces of genetic parts uh, and do useful things with biology? And where is biotech's Apple one and two, the sort of hardware components uh, of, of this whole thing um, that actually could potentially reduce that skill barrier uh, and instead, you know, let some machines do some of the work of 
building these biological devices that we can then test and do useful things with. Well, uh, on the open wetware license side, I have good news, it exists. Uh, the Open Material Transfer Agreement. This is something that was developed by the BioBrix Foundation at, uh, in, in California. I was led by a, a, a legal researcher named Linda Kale. Um, and the Open MTA is a material transfer agreement that's somewhat like the universal biological material transfer agreement that, that Agin uses. But this material transfer agreement, uh, you know, it is an agreement between a sender of material and a recipient. And that material can be uh, DNA, it can be cells, it's basically any material, um, but it's generally something, some sort of biological material. And this agreement explicitly gives the recipient of the material the permission to modify that material, to redistribute, share that material with their friends or, or uh, collaborators or customers, um, and to commercialize that material if they want to. It enables free and easy sharing of biological material between academia, between industry, between community labs, um, everyone. Uh, so this is a very promising development. And then on the GNU Linux side, well, we have the Free Gene Project. So at the Synthetic Biology 7.0 conference back in 2017, uh, Drew Endy, who's one of the godfathers of the entire field of synthetic biology, uh, got up on stage and he announced that the BioBricks Foundation had received donations sufficient to fund the purchase and synthesis and free distribution under the Open Material Transfer Agreement of thousands of useful off-patent and IP-free synthetic genetic parts. Now I was watching the live stream of that conference. I was I was stuck <laughs> I was stuck on an Air Force base for a research collaboration, and the conference was literally on the other side of the world. So I stayed up all night watching it. Uh, but I got very excited when I saw this, and so I reached out to Drew and was like, "How can I how can I contribute?" And he redirected me to Keone, uh, who's this uh, uh, bioengineering prodigy who's been bioengineering since he was like 12 years old. Um, uh, and it turns out that the project was Keone's idea. And the Biobrix Foundation had hired Keone to lead the project tech, project's technical side. And so I uh, started volunteering as a, as a wetware developer for the project. And I actually named the project. I told them they should call it Free Genes because who doesn't want, who doesn't love free stuff? Free Genes, it's like free software, it's like free beer, it's like free speech, free genes. Um, and so we've been working on uh, developing useful wetware toolkits uh, since then. Um, and so now that we have this open wetware license, and we have the opportunity to make uh, genetic parts and genetic libraries free, what should we do with that? And uh, so the thing that I've been working on um, in my, with whatever time I can lend to it um, over the past few years is trying to figure out how do we make biotechnological production scalable, open, and frugal. So scalable, that means how do we make it the stuff that we tinker with biology capable of going from sort of bench top and academic um, sort of small scale experiments to large scale supply of a good or service. You know, how do you go from make, you know, making a little bit of enzyme, uh, you know, in, in a shaker in a lab to uh, taking that same organism and scaling it up to manufacture enough enzyme to provide that product to like everyone in your country uh, or something like that. Um, so that's scalable. And then open, how do we make sure that the biotechnological productive capacity we develop is, is in the public domain, is it's a public good, and it's open source so people can see what's going on. They can understand, you know, characteristics of the genetic parts, the characteristics of the strains, um, and it runs on sort of open source and shareable hardware um, in, in a way that uh, ensures that there, there aren't, you know, million dollar instruments that we don't know exactly how they work on the inside because it's all proprietary and, and locked up by a company. Um, and how do we do that with, you know, not just hardware, but also the software and the wetware and, and the protocols, you know, how you actually uh, combine the software, hardware and the wetware to do useful things with biology. And then frugal, how do we make this as cheap and easy as possible? You know, uh, right now it's expensive. The more, the cheaper and easier we can make it, the more people can become bioengineers, the more biotechnological productive capacity we can build out, the faster we can accelerate the transition to sustainable human civilization. So let's do this. So in terms of specific wetware design goals, if we think about how we're gonna achieve these things, um, I think uh, the thing I've been aiming at, uh, and we've been aiming at is 
let's make recombinant protein expressions. That's, you know, genetically engineered uh, uh, microbes manufacturing specific proteins or enzymes that you want. Recombinant protein expression, uh, secretion and purification as cheap and easy as possible. So we got to make the microbes make the protein. We got to make the microbes secrete the protein out of themselves. And we got to make the microbes, uh, we got to, we got to be able to purify that protein, separate it from everything else, concentrate it, uh, put it in a solution that we want, make that process as cheap as easy as possible. And as part of this, we also have to need to make it easy to engineer and optimize strains. So that means we've got to be able to change the genetic, uh, change the DNA in uh, the cells that we're running. We've got to delete genes, we've got to insert genes. Uh, we've got to be able to do some engineering and optimization and a decent throughput in order to get to high production strains. So uh, towards this goal, um, I uh, helped organize an initiative called Frenzymes. This is a team and a project uh, enabled by free genes in the open MTA. And its goal is exactly what I've been describing to you, democratize recombinant protein production and purification and strain engineering. Um, and uh, you know, it formed out of a global online class that happened uh, that was run by a guy named Manu Prakash, who um, his, his lab at Stanford has it specializes in frugal science. They've developed a $1 origami paper microscopes that have, you know, 150x zoom, or they're incredible. I, I love them. I have a bunch of them around here, but I won't, I won't show them to you. Um, and his lab developed uh, $1 paper-based uh, centrifuges that can spin at like 30,000 uh, revolutions per minute, but that cost a, a dollar and, and can sort of separate blood samples for, for doing malaria testing. Uh, so this is the this is the guy who organized this class, and I joined this class uh, in fall of 2020. Um, and uh, I've met a bunch of like-minded uh, people who cared about uh, trying to make it cheaper and easier, and democratizing bio biotechnology and biotechnological production. And so we organized ourselves into a team, and uh, we started uh, started working on this. And uh, at the moment, we have team members on five continents in at least nine countries. We have three community, actually, I think we have four community, we have four collaborating labs now, four community labs and, and plus the Philippine Genome Center at Mendenhall in the Philippines. Um, yeah, this is just a, a map of uh, you know, many of the, of the uh, team members that we have. Um, and so how do we go about democratizing uh, uh, recombinant protein production? So a challenge that we face is that E. coli, E. coli is you know, the molecular workhorse uh, for, for uh, doing biology, biotechnology and bioengineering, uh, building DNA, uh, but it requires expensive equipment to extract recombinant protein. So because it's a gram negative bacterium, E. coli has got two cell wall, uh, two cell membranes, um, and it's not very good at secreting proteins. Um, and as a result, it's very good at accumulating proteins within itself. And so if you have access to the instruments, the equipment required to pop all the E. coli cells, to lyse them, uh, and then to spin them at very, very high speeds to separate the popped E. coli cell wall gunk uh, from the actual soluble protein that you're interested in, if you have all that equipment, then E. coli is fine for producing protein. But the problem is that equipment is expensive. Sonicators and French presses, which are the things that pop the E. coli cells, these cost thousands of dollars. And refrigerated centrifuges, depending on the scale of the centrifuge, how, how much liquid it can handle and spin down, these things cost anywhere from thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. That is not democratized, that is not frugal, that's not the way we want it to go. So our approach was to look at, well, how does Bio, the biotech industry manufacture proteins. Because biotech, the biotech industry also cares about cost. They just do it at a much larger scale. Um, and the way they do it is secretion. Um, and they use different platform organisms than E. coli for manufacturing and secreting their proteins. In particular, two of the most commonly used industrial platform organisms for manufacturing enzymes are the bacterium, Bacillus subtilis, and the yeast, Pichia pastoris. Actually, the yeast is also, is. Its, its real name now is Komagataella fafii because it was discovered by a team in Japan uh, before it was, <laughs> it was found that it was discovered first in, in Japan by a team that named it Komagataella. Um, and then it was only later that a different team discovered it and called it Pekia. But we'll just call it Pekia because ever, everyone has called it Pekia for a long time. Um, these proteins uh, or these cells uh, secrete enzymes 
very, very efficiently if you engineer them properly. Um, and this is great for a number of reasons. Number one, secretion is kind of a form of purification because if you're getting your organism, your cell to specifically pump your protein out of the cell, then most of the other non-interesting proteins, the, the other proteins that are just there in the cell are gonna stay inside the cell. And so it's already doing a separation um, of, of your protein from other stuff that you don't want. Um, and then you don't have to use expensive equipment for popping the cells or for spinning the cells down because the cells are big and sort of heavy enough uh, uh, that um, you can just add uh, certain chemicals to the solution. Uh, these, these are clumping agents or flocculating agents and they cause the cells to all clump together. And then once they've clumped together, they settle down to the bottom. This is actually how uh, the same principle that works in, in sewage treatment plants, the, the same thing. You add, add this material, causes everything to clump together and settle to the bottom and it cleans out the, uh, cleans out the, the water, the, the supernatant. Um, and in the same, in the same way, uh, what you're left with after you add a flocculating agent um, to, these, uh, uh, to these types of cells, Bacillus settles with Pichia pastoris, is they settle to the bottom and you're left with a supernatant that contains the enzymes that they have secreted. And so it's a great way to avoid expensive equipment for uh, separating your protein of interest from uh, the cells. So we want to design, uh, we want to, for, so for our wetware design, we want to make genetic toolkits that make it easy to engineer Pichia pastoris. So what types of genetic parts do we need? We need promoters for regulating and promoting the, the transcription of genes, gene expression. We need selection markers. So that's like antibiotic resistance markers, oxytrophic selection markers. These are things that enable you to select and make sure that the, the cells have actually taken up the, the new genetic components that you want them to. Uh, terminators, just for stopping transcription. Homology arms, these are very important for genomic integration. So it's basically just regions of pieces of sequence that are identical to specific sequences at specific locations in the, uh, in the yeast genome so that you can integrate, you can insert your uh, genetic device uh, that, that, that manufactures your protein of interest at that specific location in the genome. Um, and also, we're interested in looking at how do we, how do we avoid uh, problems of genetic instability that are caused by integrating many copies of, of the same thing right next to each other. This is because um, generally in these organisms, uh, you know, in Pichia pastoris and Bacillus subtilis, um, novel genetic parts, gen genetically engineered devices are integrated onto the genome, whereas in E. coli, they're usually replicated on plasmids. And the nice thing about plasmids is that you, know, they, you, you can get a lot of copies of the plasmid within each cell. And therefore, when you turn on the expression of a, of a protein, you're turning on expression from many, many copies of that. And so you get, can you get, they get to very high expression levels pretty easily. Whereas if you're doing genomic integration, it can be more difficult to get many, many copies uh, there. And there are some strategies to, for doing it that involve sort of harnessing the, the cell's natural uh, sort of recombination machinery to create duplicates of, uh, the, of the machinery, of the, set, of the genetic device that you're interested in. Um, but those can introduce genetic instability. So we're working on ways to avoid that. And uh, importantly, we've already, uh, the Frenzymes team already has some of this wetware um, designed and synthesized and made freely available through the Free Genes Project. So I'll just hop over. Uh, this is the Free Genes Project website, by the way. You can get a lot of useful free genes uh, from this website. Uh, you know, you can go to open myocomy stuff, you can get uh, sets of different useful enzymes, uh, that, like the actual genes for the enzymes, you still need to slot them into like uh, expression vectors, but you can see the cost of them is zero dollars. So if you're interested in libraries of useful genetic parts, go to the Free Genes website, stanford.freegenes.org. It's great. And this is the Open Yeast Collection. So this was designed primarily by my friend Scott Ponal, who's one of the, uh, one of the other leaders of the, of the Frenzymes project. Um, and uh, it's got a number of promoters for yeast, um, for both Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's brewer's yeast, the yeast that we use in, you know, brewing beer or, or baking bread. Um, uh, and uh, it's got a number of uh, protein coding sequences, secretion tags, including Pichia secretion tags, um, uh, other regulatory elements. It's got some selection markers, it's got the homology regions for genomic integration, um, all these good things. And it's also got these nice assembly connectors. So you can stitch together multiple genes 
um, into these uh, uh, multi-transcription unit genetic cassettes that you can then put on a vector or insert into the genome. Um, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, so this is, this is very promising on the Pickia side. Um, and then on the Bacillus side, we've also been working to sort of develop similar toolkits, um, promoters, selection markers, terminators, homology arms, all and, and secretion tags, importantly. Um, these are all necessary for engineering uh, Bacillus subtilis. And uh, our, our wetware toolkits are in a little bit of er, er, an earlier stage of development for Bacillus. We do have a Bacillus protein secretion toolkit. Let's see, it's right here on the Free Genes website. This is libraries of specifically secretion tags. So Bacillus subtilis has about 150 secretion tags um, uh, naturally occurring. Um, and uh, as I'll talk a little bit more uh, later, uh, you really want to be able to try all 150 of them. So I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that later. Um, but just to, just to note, we have designs for all of these different types of parts for Bacillus. Um, and we've got these designs in Benchling. Uh, we actually have the designs ordered um, uh, through IDT, through Twist. Um, and uh, we're in the process of finalizing cloning and the sequence verification of these parts before we start building them together. But once we have those clone and sequence verified, we'll be able to stitch together uh, vectors like this. This is a, a simulated um, assembly uh, that we simulated using a, a software package called Poly, which is good for bio design uh, that we collaborate with. Uh, it's got E. coli selection marker, E. coli origin replication, Bacillus subtilis origin replication, Bacillus subtilis selection marker, a nice pr uh, promoter uh, that's sort of lactose or IPTG inducible. And then it's got this gene for this PFU SS07D polymerase. So this is very similar to the fusion uh, thermostable DNA polymerase. It's very good for PCR, very good for amplifying genes, high fidelity, fast, good, good processivity. It's a, great, it's a great polymerase and it's off patent now. And we got some purification tags on here, his tags, silic binding tags also a, a, a GFP reporter tag um, so that we can quantify expression fluorescence. Um, so these are all uh, parts that have been uh, synthesized. We're just cloning and sequence verifying them now. Um, and so in order to sort of organize these parts, um, it was useful for us to think about how, uh, think about an assembly standard, you know, a, a standard way of putting these different types of parts together that will generate useful genetic devices. And in particular, uh, we want to leverage mo modular cloning or MoClo or, or U-loop assembly standards. These are based on Golden Gate assembly, uh, which use type 2S restriction enzymes. The nice thing about type 2S restriction enzymes, I'll just uh, hop over here really quick and show you uh, some bench link stuff. So this is, a, this is a type 2S restriction enzyme site. You see it in highlighted, that's where the enzyme binds. That's the sequence it recognizes and binds. But you can see that it cuts away from where it binds. So the overhangs that it generates can be anything at all. Basically, you can change the sequence to be anything, and the enzyme will still bind and cut over there. And so simply by choosing specific sets of four base pair overhangs um, to define particular part types, you can build an assembly standard where you can essentially assemble many, many parts together um, all at once in a single reaction and to build something useful. So what are, the, what are the types of things you could, uh, you could usefully build with such an assembly standard? Well, you could build the backbone of a plasmid, uh, a backbone of a plasmid designed specifically to first be replicated and built and propagated in E. coli, but then to be transferred over to another more uh, industrially useful uh, cell type like Bacillus or like Pickia, um, and then either replicate there or be integrated there. And so for that, you would need two homology arms, a three prime and a five prime homology arm. So that's in the, in the, in the vector cloning, VECLO assembly standard. You'd need an E. coli selection marker and an E. coli or origin replication, as we've talked about before. You'll want a target selection marker and you want that selection marker to be on between the five prime and three prime end. So if you follow the, the ribbon, this is, this is sort of an imagined diagram of a single plasmid all looped together. Um, and uh, so we call this, uh, we call all this whole thing all clo, um, and but we call each subset. So the the, the vector backbone uh, part of it we call vec clo, uh, and we have sort of uh, overhangs uh, des uh, designated for this. This is actually um, uh, this type of assembly standard is in the open yeast collection already. So you can build um, uh, modular yeast uh, vector backbones using this assembly standard. 
Um, then we have five close. So this is for the five prime untranslated region upstream of, of an actual protein coding gene sequence um, and different types of parts that you need here. So there's this assembly linker, this, this five prime assembly linker over here in the five clo and this three prime assembly linker in the three clo. These allow you to stitch together many different uh, protein coding genes and do sort of multi-gene uh, cassettes um, and either integrate those or replicate those in, in a target organism. Uh, and that can be useful, uh, like I said, both for increasing the expression level of a particular enzyme, if you're trying to just express a whole bunch of one enzyme, or if you need to express two enzymes at once in order to manufacture one of them. For instance, if you're making a restriction enzyme where the restriction enzyme will chew up, will, will chop up the host cell's DNA unless the host cell's DNA is protected by the cognate methyl transferase of that restriction enzyme. Um, that's an ex example of where you would need to co-express two enzymes at once and assembling these things together is one way to do that. So that's the assembly linker. Recombination sites, five prime and three prime. So these are targets for enzymes called recombinases, which are very good at basically flipping and, and, and rearranging pieces of DNA um, based on uh, where the recombination sites are and deleting pieces of DNA. And this is very useful for strain engineering. So if you imagine, let's say that, you know, in order to get to a high yielding um, uh, cell type, we wanted to delete all of the protein degrading enzymes that that cell naturally secretes. So for instance, bacillus, uh, bacillus subtilis naturally secretes about seven extracellular proteases that, that uh, go out into the outside of the cell and that chew up proteins outside the cell. So if we wanted to delete the genes for all seven of those, what we would need to do is we need to design a vector uh, for, uh, that has homology arms uh, around each of those protease genes. So they'll integrate and replace that protease gene. We need a selection marker to select for that integration that deletes the protease gene. And then we would need a way to delete the selection marker so that we could reuse it and delete the other, uh, and delete the other six uh, protease genes. And the recombinase sites are really great for that last step of, of rem removing the thing that you've added in so that you can reuse it later. Um, so that's what those are there for. Promoters regulate protein expression. Ribozyme insulators, these are parts that have been developed by uh, Chris Voigt's lab at, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Um, and they basically cut off all of the messenger RNA that's upstream of the insulator. And they make the behavior the, of each genetic part much more predictable, um, le less likely to suddenly not work when you change out what gene you're trying to express or something like that. Ribozyme binding sites, always important. And then we get into protein, the, the proclo, the protein cloning assembly standard. And this is the way that we'll be uh, able to, you know, uh, test out many different methods of secreting proteins and many different methods of purifying proteins as well. So this assembly standard has this main protein coding sequence. That's the enzyme that you want to make uh, in the middle of it. But then it's got a part for secretion tag, a part for up to three N-terminal tags. And these tags generally come in uh, three different flavors. Uh, a purification tag, so that's something that binds to, uh, for instance, uh, silica, so sand. Uh, you, we, we have a silica binding domain in, in this library um, so that you can purify proteins by running them over sand or just like silica particles, very cheap. Um, we've got cellulose binding domains. Uh, histidine tags are the, are the most common, commonly used ones in academia, um, but those require expensive resins, so we don't, uh, we're not planning to use those. Those aren't frugal. Uh, but the silica binding tags, those are, those are much more promising. Um, reporter tags, so these are basically uh, for uh, IP-free, so public domain uh, fluorescent uh, uh, protein reporters. So like a free-to-use GFP, FUGFP, or M-Cherry, uh, which is now off patent. that's a red fluorescent protein. We could tag those on here, or we can also tag them on the C-terminal end as well, depending on what we want to try. Um, and that enables us to measure our protein expression much more easily. We, we don't need to do like SDS page gels um, or, or other sort of uh, more difficult and laborious and manual processes to measure how much enzyme we're making and how much enzyme we're secreting versus how much is stuck in the cell and how much enzyme we're able to purify with a particular procedure. Um, we'll be able to measure that all with fluorescence, which is very, uh, which is a much simpler, easier, and higher, higher throughput, and therefore more frugal uh, way of doing this. And then finally, we have cleavage tags closest to the protein. Uh, and these are basically protease recognition sites or their self-cleaving domains called NTNs. Uh, and these are there because 
maybe if you're manufacturing an enzyme, you don't want it to have all these tags on it. Uh, and so the, in, uh, so the N-terminal and the C-terminal cleavage tags are basically give you the option to cut off all the tags when you don't need them anymore and just leave yourself with that particular protein or dominant protein or enzyme that you want. Um, and then, yeah, finally, we've got uh, three clo, which is the sort of the simplest. We've got the terminator that terminates the transcription of the gene, the three prime recombination site, and the three prime assembly linker. So all of this together is all clo, and we're working on sort of uh, uh, finish fi finalizing designs for all the overhangs and all of the the part types for these sets for uh, for use in bacillus and uh, Ikea. Um, and one immediate application of this uh, that we've already sort of uh, designed and built out is how do you select the right bacillus cellulose secretion signal peptide tag? So as I mentioned before, bacillus has over 150 secretion tags just that are just naturally occur in its own proteins. Um, and you can stick these different secretion tags in front of whatever protein you want to secrete, um, and some of them will probably work but uh, a lot of them will not work. And the problem is that it is basically impossible to predict beforehand which of the 150 secretion tags will work with your protein and which one will not. Uh, and so you basically need to test every single one of them for each protein that you want. So how do you do this in an easy way that doesn't take a whole lot of time and effort and money? Um, and so we designed, and actually I, I designed um, uh, certainly a, a type of plasmid called a library plasmid to solve this problem. So this is a plasmid, it's about 7,000 base pairs long, and it contains, I want to say 30 or so, um, bacillus cellulose secretion tags. And each of these secretion tags, it's got its own custom designed ribosome binding site uh, to go with it that should give it high expression levels. Um, and it's all flanked by those type 2S restriction enzyme sites that I mentioned before. And the, the, when, the, when those type 2 enzyme uh, restriction sites are, are bound and cut by their enzyme, they will generate for each one of these 30 or so tags, they'll generate the exact same four base pair overhang. And what that allows you to do is you can build a vector uh, that basically has everything in it except the, except the secretion tag part. You can put a dropout cassette in the secretion tag part, and then you can cut out the dropout cassette, and then you can put in these library plasmids and you can add the restriction enzyme and it'll cut out every single one of these individual parts and it'll give it all the same overhangs and you'll get a combinatorial assembly in one pot that allows you to build in one enzymatic reaction, just a single reaction. You can ideally build all 150 variants with all 150 secretion tags. And then all you have to do is transform those variants into bacillus uh, and then basically screen the different colonies, put them in like a 96 well plate, grow them up, and uh, then, you know, pellet, pellet them down, flocculate them down, take off the, the liquid culture, and measure for fluorescence. And if you can, and basically the fluorescence in the supernamed uh, of the liquid culture should tell you something about the relative secretion levels. And so you can pick for the ones that are secreting the best. So that's, that's ideally how you can get to high secretion in bacillus subtilis of whatever protein that you want to do uh, without, it need, without it taking a lot of money um, or effort. Um, and so that's on the wetware side. But you know, with all of this, uh, you know, we're talking about needing to design, build, and test many different genetic constructs um, and potentially to do strain engineering to get to high yield open source uh, strains for manufacturing whatever protein that we want. And in order to do that, we need the infrastructure to do high throughput strain engineering for high yield protein secretion in, in a way that is not extraordinarily expensive or time intensive. Um, and so how do we build, for instance, a frugal biofoundry? This is something that's a sort of semi-automated um, that will run most of the pro laboratory processes related to you know, doing these genetic assembly reactions, these Golden Gate reactions to build these genetic devices setting up the transformations to put the device, put the DNA devices into the cells, uh, setting up the colony picking to, you know, basically select for the cells that have taken up the genetic devices, uh, and setting up, you know, sequencing reactions, setting up the measurement reactions. These are all things that can be automated and should be automated uh, because it reduces the amount of skill required, uh, the skill barrier, and it also increases what you're able to do. Um, and so if you can do that cheaply, uh, then 
things are looking very promising. And so we're leveraging uh, the OpenTron's OT2 liquid handler. So this is uh, the, sort of the cheapest liquid handler in the world that, at the moment that we know of. Um, it's capable of uh, basically running those various laboratory processes I just described, and it costs in the range of 5,000 to 10,000 US dollars. So, you know, about the same as an Apple II. Uh, yeah. um, and then on the sequencing side, so, you know, that, that, the OpenTron is basically, uh, we, we, we've just talked about all the wetware designs. The OpenTrons, we're working on getting it so that it handles the build side. So we've got the design and the build, legs of the design build test cycle. And then on the test side, we need to be able to uh, first determine if the sequence of the, uh, of the parts from our genetic assembly reaction is actually correct. Did we actually build and assemble the genetic device that we think we did? And so in, in order to do that, we need to be able to do DNA sequencing and we need to be able to do it frugally. And the best way to do that as the, the, that I've found is the Oxford Nano 4 Minion DNA sequencer. This is a DNA sequencer that's the size of a smartphone. Uh, it costs a thousand U.S. dollars uh, rather than the twenty-five thousand dollars that the that the cheapest Illumina instrument costs, um, and it works very well uh, uh, for plasmid sequencing. Uh, it's able to do sort of high fidelity plasmid sequencing if you treat it right. Um, so that's the sequencing side, and then once you know that you've got the genetic construct that you want, then you have to test how does it, how well does it behave? You know, how well does it do the thing that you want it to do? In, in, for instance, manufactured secrete protein. And how do you measure that in a way that is high throughput and that doesn't require a whole bunch of effort of laboriously like putting, you know, hundreds of different samples all on the same measurement device over and over and over again. Um, really what you want to be able to do is measure 90, at least 96 well plates simultaneously. Um, and, and ideally you want to be able to measure like fluorescence and absorbance from those 96 well plates. Um, and so the cheapest way that we've been able to find to do this is this FlowPi open source fluorescence imager. So this was actually developed by a, a lab in Chile, uh, Fernand Federici's lab. Um, and the, the leaders on the project were uh, Isaac Nunez and uh, Tamara something. I don't remember her last name, uh, but uh, they built this open hardware. So this is an open source design for a fluorescence imager. And the total cost of components for this fluorescence imager, which is capable of basically taking a, 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 an image of a full 96 well plate, and if you calibrate it correctly, it can quantify the fluorescence in each well in that 96 well plate. It can also measure the concentrations of DNA uh, uh, if you add like a, an intercalating fluorescent dye, uh, which is really, really nice because then you don't have to buy like an expensive nano drop instrument that costs a few thousand dollars to quantify your DNA concentrations uh, before you set up your genetic assembly reactions. This thing costs $200 in components to build. Now you do need access to a laser cutter and a 3D printer to build some of the, to, to actually cut out and, and build some of the parts that go into it. But if you have those things, which a lot of people do because fab labs are all over the world, um, then you can build this thing for about $200, which is great. Um, and this, this is point I should mention that OpenTrons actually has uh, sponsored Frenzymes. And as part of that sponsorship, they donated to us uh, enough equipment that we would have fully stocked uh, OpenTrons robots uh, with the multi-channel pipettes for the P300, P20, um, and the magnetic module and temperature module uh, at all of our collaborating uh, wet labs, or all four of our original collaborating wet labs. So now we have an OpenTrons robot in Vancouver, Chicago. We have one in Kumasi, Ghana at the Hive Bio Community Lab. And we've got one at the Philippine Genome Center at Mindanao. And so we're working on developing those protocols to enable the setting up genetic assembly reactions, running the transformations, doing the colony picking, setting up the samples for sequencing and for fluorescent measurement, all those things, uh, frugal biofoundries. Uh, we've also been sponsored by the Shellworth Foundation. Uh, they gave us a $5,000 flash grant. They're, they're great. They're, they sponsor a lot of open source initiatives. Um, and I just want to flag, you know, $5,000 doesn't sound like a lot in sort of academic terms, you know, especially compared to like the cost of most lab equipment, like those $25,000 iSeqs that I was talking about before. But for $5,000, that's enough money for us, for Frenzymes, to buy three nanopore DNA sequencers and build four fluorescence imagers. So we're pretty happy with that $5,000 flash can. I think it's going to uh, take us pretty far because we've been able to compile, you know, what, what's the best way to do this for the least amount of money. Um, 
So what are some other challenges? So once we've, you know, once we've done all this designing and building and testing, and we've actually got strains that are manufacturing proteins that we'd want, then we need to actually scale that up a little bit and do frugal protein production and fermentation. So the way that this is normally done uh, is you, the standard method, you've got the baffled glass shaker flasks in like a, a shaker incubator. Um, the, the flasks themselves are tens to hundreds of dollars. Or you can, you know, if you go a little bit higher, a tire scale um, and with more control, you've got bioreactors. These are things that have like these motors, these, these, these uh, propellers that sort of mix up the cells and they, they can pump in oxygen, they can pump in like uh, acids and bases to control the pH, all these things. But these things cost thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. They are, they are not democratized yet, at least not at any scale. Um, and so our approach, uh, we talked to uh, a, a really, really skilled <coughs> democratized biotechnologist named Sebastian Kachoba, um, who lives in New York City. Um, and he has come up with a design for a frugal bioreactor. He also found, uh, he, he came up with a design for a frugal shaker flask as well, which is a two liter Pepsi bottle, <laughs> which apparently works quite well uh, for like it's 100 to 200 uh, milliliter uh, cultures. So if you need a frugal shaker flask and you don't have a, a, a glass bottle, you know, use, a, use a Pepsi bottle, uh, they're great. Um, but the one, the thing we're really interested in is his frugal bioreactor. So he, he came up with the design using this very skinny uh, five liter carboy, uh, the five liter plastic uh, uh, container. Um, and uh, it basically combines that with like some heating pads from a 3D printer and an aquarium pump and like a foam uh, uh, plug uh, to keep uh, contaminants out. Uh, and that's, that's basically most of the components uh, for this thing. It costs about $180 components, which is like, 10, 10 to 100 times uh, less than the cost of a, a comparable uh, commercial bioreactor. And what's so clever about his design is that because the, the plastic container is so skinny, uh, when you pump the air in from the aquarium pump to oxygenate the sample, to make sure that your cells have oxygen so they can grow and they can make your protein, the bubbles from the air actually set up a sort of circulating current that makes sure the cells are mixed evenly. So you get you get the oxygenation and the mixing all in one without needing that expensive motor and propeller stuff to stir the cells. It's a, a quite a beautiful design and a, we're really looking forward to using it. Um, so once we've manufactured protein, then we need to get to purification. And so the standard method for purification is something called a mobilized metal ion affinity chromatographer. So that's IMAC, uh, that's basically nickel, uh, nickel IMAC resin, this is, this is what you use with histidine tags, with his tags. Uh, you know, it's the most commonly used uh, purification tag for recombinant proteins. Um, the problem is that the nickel IMAC resin costs hundreds of dollars and the chromatography instruments, the, the, the things that actually like do all the pumping of your sample onto columns and then you know, the buffers onto the, onto the columns uh, to wash away stuff and then elute your sample, those instruments cost thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. They're not democratized. So we, we, we thought through a few different approaches and it depends on what enzyme we're going after. So for thermostable enzymes, like uh, you know thermostable DNA polymerases that are used in PCR, uh, you actually can get away with just purification with heat because not many proteins are actually stable at 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so if you heat your sample up to 90 degrees Celsius, uh, most of the non thermostable DNA polymerase uh, proteins will precipitate uh, and then just sort of like fall to the bottom of your, of, of your sample. And you can just uh, pour off the supernatant and your supernatant contains your enzymes that you're interested in. Uh, and then you can dialyze them or, or do other things like that to concentrate them and change out the buffers. So that's a great way to do it for thermostable, thermostable enzymes. And then for reagent grade enzymes, um, you know, for, for other stuff where we only need about 90% purity, that's for, you know, like restriction enzymes, ligases, the means of all building these genetic devices, uh, we're going to pursue secretion and dialysis. So, uh, you know, secrete your enzymes and then dialyze them. That's basically put them in this tubing and tie off the tubing. And the tubing has very, very tiny holes in it, tiny pores. Um, and the pores are small enough that your proteins can't get out, but big enough that like water can get in, salts can get out. And so you put the big, you put the tubes with your sample into a big tub 
um, containing a buffer that you want your enzyme to be in. Uh, and eventually it'll equilibrate and replace the buffer that your enzyme is currently in with uh, the buffer that you want it to be in. Um, and so these are great uh, dialysis clips if, from commercial companies. They cost like $75 for six of these plastic clips. But Sebastian Kachov has told us that you can also just use potato chip bag clips and you, they're like 10 times cheaper. It's, it's much easier. Um, and then finally, for high purity applications, you know, if we, for things where we want, want more than 99% purity, for instance, if you wanted to start exploring uh, frugal biopharmaceutical manufacturing, you know, how would we go about doing that? And we are think we are collaborating a little bit with the Open Insulin Project. Uh, we'll pursue secretion and then frugal chromatography. So we had uh, uh, a mentor uh, for this project uh, named Dushan Sivaratnam. He's a PhD candidate uh, in the in the United Kingdom. Um, and he was uh, he developed methods for extracting silica directly from sand and then turning it into silica microparticles, just using like acids and bases, um, and then purifying enzymes using that using silica binding peptide tags. And so that's that's a great frugal chromatography uh, system. Another potential alternative: elastin-like polypeptide tags. These are these are uh, protein tags that'll reversibly um, aggregate together in the presence of like uh, excess of salt or, or heat. Um, and so basically anything that's tagged, only the proteins that are tagged with, they'll aggregate together and they'll pal it out. Um, and then you can remove uh, the superdatant that has all the other proteins that you don't want. And you change the salt conditions, change the heat conditions, and they'll resolubilize. Um, and then you can have your enzyme that you want and you can clip off the tags with, with your protease cleavage uh, parts. Um, and those are off patent as of 2021, worth exploring. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, we've, these are all sort of different things. Um, how, how do we actually go about uh, working on this? Um, so last year in 2021, uh, we decided to organize ourselves through IGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the first uh, precursor to IGEM in 2003 at, at, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. About 23 people or, you know, could fit in a room. And then uh, uh, what, 13 years later, uh, the iGym Giant Jamboree in 2016 had thousands of students uh, from hundreds of teams all competing uh, to build useful genetic devices and, and, and build useful things with biology. It's a wonderful uh, pr program, wonderful competition. Um, and so we organized as an iGym team, um, uh, 2020 and Friends on iGym team. And I actually do want to show you a video. Let me just click over here really quick. Let me see if this works. Uh, Let's see, there we go. Quick. The reason I want to show this to you is because it's better than anything that I. Uh, we are in an age of biotechnology. Yet the means of biotechnological production are expensive and hard to access, especially for people in developing countries and those outside academia and industry. Imagine a world where biotech countries are as accessible and affordable as your neighborhood community center without the legal and financial obstacles they have today. Would our global outlook on health, science, agriculture, energy, and climate be different? Now think of the cost of a biofactory. At the bare minimum, the biomaterials, chemical reagents, and hardware, all of this is expensive. Our plan is to tackle this head on, a handful of steps at a time. In collaboration with the Vibrix Foundation Free Genes Project, as well as the Open Bioeconomy Lab, we, an international team under the name of Open Science Global, plan to frugally produce and purify the best off patent thermostable DNA polymerase by designing appropriate plasmid vectors for production in grass organisms such as Bacillus subtilis sapicia pastoris and incorporating modules such as M13 sequences, silica binding domain secretion tags, and more with a more powerful mobile assembly standard. In addition, we will be developing an open plate reader and powerful automation software to optimize and expand the DBTL cycle in conjunction with other frugal biofoundry components. With proper funding, we can expand the protein collection to include other important enzymes, including T4DNA ligase, PNK, and type 2 S restriction enzymes, all necessary components in the frugal bio toolkit. With this, solutions to world issues such as the climate crisis, sustainability, and more could be one pipette away. So 
I wanted to show you that because it's better than anything that I've ever made in my life. Um, and the, 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 the whole iGIP team, especially the ones who put together the videos, um, deserve a ton of credit. Actually, uh, we had a number of Brazilian uh, team, team members. Um, Luisa Hesgeth uh, was one of the leaders of the video editing efforts. Uh, Isaac Guerrero um, led up the, the software design side of our project, and he, he actually got hired by iGEM after our, um, uh, after our team uh, finished up, um, and also Giovanna McClouf, um as well. So um, the, the outcome of us being an iGEM last year uh, was uh, that now, uh, this year, we're not doing an iGEM team because we're collaborating directly with the iGEM organization. So free genes, iGEM, and Frenzymes, we're now collaborating. It's wonderful. Um, and the thing we're collaborating on is that iGEM is uh, partnering with the Free Genes Project to resynthesize its entire uh, registry, or, or rather its, its distribution, so, so that all of the, the genetic library that sends out to all of the international genetically engineered machines teams every year uh, to take part in the competition to build their genetic devices. It's having that, it's having that distribution of parts redesigned and resynthesized through the Free Genes Project under the Open Material Transfer Agreement. And it's eventually going to basically become a repository for all these different useful wetware libraries you know some of them drawn from the existing registry some of them drawn from other sources but it's going to be linux for biotechnology it's going to it's going to power so many useful things and it's going to be freely accessible to everyone through the free genes project it's no longer going to be a walled garden it's it's, it's wonderful i'm very excited about that um and so uh that's uh, more or less all i had to uh, talk to you about except now i want to encourage you uh if any of this is interesting to you, you are more than welcome to join us. And I'm talking to the students, any students who might be hearing this. I'm talking to any graduate students or, or researchers, talking to professors. Um, we need you to help democratize the means of biotechnological production. Uh, reach out to us at friendsimes at gmail.com. Um, we have so many things that we would love to collaborate with you and, and help work on. You know, we've got designing and building and testing expression of enzymes, like, like we mentioned, uh, designing and validating the you know, genetic assembly standard, all clo. Learn, uh, designing Opatron's protocols to automate bioengineering, uh, doing advanced software bio design with this, this, this poly package that we collaborate with, um, uh, that we work on with. Um, learn to help and uh, build open source lab equipment, including you know the FlowPy, the bioreactors, chromatography systems, all these good things. Uh, uh, sequence many plasmids cheaply on the nanopore devices. Um, building and kickstarting a free cells project. So that's some, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet. I talked a lot about free genetic parts, but uh, the free genetic parts are not quite as useful if uh, when you put them into a cell, the cell itself is locked up by intellectual property restrictions. And so it's difficult uh, currently to identify uh, sources of cells that are unambiguously in the public domain and can unambiguously be you know, modified, redistributed, shared uh, easily. And so we need some sort of free cells project to go along with the free genes project so that we have free cells that we can put our free genes in in order to develop free strains for manufacturing the means of biotechnological production and, and doing useful things with them and building the biotechnology commons and, uh, and globally distributing biotechnology, growing biotechnological product of capacity and uh, accelerating uh, the transition to sustainable human civilization. So um, if any of that sounds interesting to you, feel free to reach out. That's sort of everything I had. And I would be very happy to take uh, any questions. I think that's everything.